In Revelation chapter one, verse nine, John said, I, your brother, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now I want you to notice that he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. It was intentional. It was the hand of God because he had a divine appointment. Sometimes when you feel that you're banished, you've been exiled, you need to understand that God has you there for a reason. And if you'll listen, you'll hear the word of the Lord. You have to know that John, the revelator, had an undying love. Every disciple except Judas and John was martyred. Every disciple. Historians tell us that they tried to martyr John by boiling him in oil. The problem is, is he wouldn't die and he would not stop preaching. So he was exiled to Patmos. After clemency, after being released, he spent his remaining days, we believe, in the church at Ephesus, living to be over a hundred years old. An undying love. He just wouldn't die. You see, John was the lover of God. He laid his head on the breast of Jesus. He's the only disciple that recorded the new commandment given by Jesus in John chapter 13, love one another. He wrote 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And he recorded Revelation 2, 4, you have forsaken your first love. Song of Songs chapter 8, verse 6 reads, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Love is as strong as death. You see, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos because his love just would not die. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 John chapter 4. Verses 7 through 21 speaks of the love of God. But today, for the sake of time, I'll only read verses 7, 8, and 9. I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. And then you can read the entirety of this portion of Scripture later in your private devotion. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, those who are loved by God, let his love continually, notice this, continually pour from you to one another because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. Wow. Verse 8, the one who doesn't love has yet to know God for God is love. The light of God's love shined within us when he sent his matchless son into the world so that we might live through him. In the gospel of John chapter 13, Jesus gave us a new commandment that you love one another. In 1 John chapter 4 here, that commandment was explained. Historians tell us that John at the end of his life would only speak three words. Now this is not in the Torah, it's in historical writings. But they say in the church of Ephesus in his old age and the closing chapter of his life, he would only speak three words, love one another. Would you pray with me? Father, bless the reading of your word. Speak to us today, Holy Spirit. Move in this church. Awaken the love of God. As Romans 5 said, pour out the love of God in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, amen. I want to get to the word that Holy Spirit dropped in my spirit, but I need to lay a foundation first very quickly. You see, we need to learn to love like God. 
verses 7 and 8. Let me break this down for you. This is called expository preaching. It's not taking a text, but it's taking the verses and breaking them down for you, expository preaching. Let me do this quickly, verses 7 and 8. The first thing I want to tell you this morning is this. Only the loved can truly love. We know this because he said here in verse 7, those who are loved by God. He begins this teaching on the love of God by saying those who are loved by God, let them continually pour out the love of God. You see, only those that are loved, that have understood the Father's love for them can truly, purely love others. Because you can't give to others what you don't already have. You've got to capture that. You can't give to others what you haven't received yourself. The second thing I want you to see here in verse seven and eight is that the love of God must be intentional and unconditional. He said here in verse seven, let this love continually pour out from you to others. So we see that this love has to be intentional and it has to be unconditional. He did not say love those who deserve it, but he just said, pour it out continually. It has to be something that you do deliberately. You have to choose to love. When the Bible says the Lord gave us that command, love the Lord your God, that's not a suggestion or a feeling. It's a command to love the Lord your God. You have to make a decision that I'm going to love him, that you're going to have to be intentional and you have to be intentional to love people. It doesn't always feel lovely. It's an intentional thing. And it has to be unconditional. You can't just choose who gets love and who doesn't. You have to, you have to love everyone the same. Let his love continually pour. So you have to know that this love that we speak of, this is agape love. This is God love. This agape love that we speak of loves hard, even when it's hard to love. God love loves hard, even when it's hard to love. When you're dealing with drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes, the down and out, the outcast of society, when you're dealing with people that are broken, bruised, people that have imperfections in their life, struggles, addictions, problems, God love, he loves real hard, even when it's hard to love. You gotta know that, you gotta capture that this morning. The third thing I want you to see here in verse seven and eight is that it is possible as a man to love like God. It is possible. You see, there are some people in life in over 40 years of ministry that I've thought, mm, they're gonna be a challenge to love. And you have done the same. It's not, always, it's not always easy to love hard. Sometimes it's hard to love. And sometimes you look at people and you think, this is a challenge for me. And you see what God did and what God does. Do we really understand what happened on the cross? How that he reached down real low to the lowest common denominator of mankind. Think of that. Would you give your son for a sinner? Would you give your son for a murderer? Would you give your son for a rapist, for someone that molested a child? Would you give your son for a homosexual, a lesbian, an adulterer, a fornicator? Would you give your son? Would you do that? And yet God chose to love hard even when it was hard to love. That's what he did. And you have to ask that question, can I do that? I can tell you that you can't do this outside of the help of Holy Spirit. Romans five, the love of God is poured into our hearts by Holy Spirit. You can't love hard when it's hard to love without his help. So you're going to, have to move outside of your feelings and you're going to have to move into the Holy Spirit and you're going to, have to let him help you. But it is possible 
as a man to love like God because it says here in verse seven, he who loves is fathered by God. Now that portion of scripture there is telling you that he that really loves like God is the one that's been born again, saved, fathered by God himself. And because you were fathered by him, his genetic endowment is in place or his genes, his DNA has been passed to you. His name is Elohim, creator God. And so he created and so it's passed to you. That's why they said of the disciples in the book of Acts, we take note that they've been with Jesus. They look like him, they act like him, they talk like him, they preach like him, they love like him. And so we can love like God. It is possible because when I look at this gospel and this word and I look at the way my father loves people, I go, I, I don't know if I can do that, but I can with his help because his DNA is inside of me. But what's, what I want you to know too is that he fathered you in love. Okay, you're like a love child. He fathered you in love and will continue to father you through love. He fathered you in love and he will father you through love. As you love, he will father you and show you how to do it. He will show you how to love people because this doesn't come natural to you. A self-sacrificing love doesn't come natural to us. And we have to lean into the Holy Spirit and be fathered by our God. Number four, verse seven and eight. You can love your way into the Father's heart. You can, because the scripture says, those who loved, those who are loved by God, let his love continually pour from you to one another because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and they will experience an intimate knowledge of him. Think of that. So you can love your way into the Father's heart. We've said this for years. If you return the tithe, you position yourself to be under God's protection. If you give the offering, you position yourself to be blessed and, and to receive more. If you give the alms to the poor, missions, benevolence, now you're getting near the heart of God because his heart is moved by the condition of mankind. And so you see, I have discovered that through giving, through loving, through ministering to those that just can't minister to themselves, I can love my way into the heart of God. I can experience an intimate knowledge of him. So here's a statement for you. The more we love others, the more he reveals himself to us. I remember a story I read many years ago in the classics, reading books like Spurgeon, Knox, Tozier, Moody, Edwards. There's a story told that this young minister went into the pastor's study. Now this was a church in the Middle East, or excuse me, in Asia. I wanna say it was India. And this young minister went into the pastor's study and he said, pastor, I wanna get near I want to get near to God. I, I, want to, I want to draw closer to him. And the old man of God stood up from behind his desk and he took the young boy over to the window that was look, overlooking the slums of India. And he says, son, you see out there? It is there that you will find him. He did not say in the temple. He did not say in the sanctuary. He did not say in the prayer chapel. He said out there, out there is where you will find him. Because that's where Jesus went. He ate with publicans and sinners. Prostitutes and adulterers were comfortable in his presence. He never condoned their sin, but he loved the person and he challenged them to come out of their sin and to be everything that God had created them to be. He saw more in them than they saw in themselves. And so you see, he said that, that old man said that, that young preacher, you'll find him out there, son. And so I believe the more we love others, the more he reveals himself to us because he finds a man or a woman that he can trust, that he can truly give himself to. Now, listen to me. I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this. God, the father is looking for someone 
that he can entrust them with his heart. God is looking for someone that he can give his heart to, that will not misrepresent him, that will not prostitute that, that will not use that to draw attention to themselves, that will not make a, a product of it, but someone, someone that will love their way into his heart and, and learn about him. You see, the Bible said that Israel knew the acts of the Lord, but Moses knew his ways. He knew his ways. He knew what he did and why he did it. That's why Moses could do what he did. Think about that. And so God is looking for someone that he can entrust his heart to them. One of the, for me, I, everybody's got their favorite stories, but one of mine is in the Old Testament with Abraham. Abraham one day is sitting at the very entrance to his tent and he sees these angels coming. And he jumps up recognizing this is a theophany or, or this is a, a God moment, a divine appointment. And so he jumps up and he, and he prepares a fire and he prepares a meal and, and he, he begins to just serve these angels. And, and God in this moment seemed to be distressed. He seemed to be challenged or concerned or moved. He's grieving over Sodom and Gomorrah. And God's heart was simply this, can I do this without first sharing this with my friend, Abraham? You see, it's one thing to say that, you're, uh, that God is your friend, but it's another thing for God to say, you're my friend. You see, it's one thing for me to say, I know so-and-so. That's another thing for that person who would say, I know Randy. God said, Abraham is my friend. And all my life, I have prayed that. Father, let me be your friend. Where you would do nothing in Beaumont without first talking about it to me. Can I do this without first stopping by One City Church and confiding, sharing my heart with that preacher whose name is Randy? God is looking for somebody that he can entrust his heart to. So the more we love others, the more he reveals himself to us. Verses seven and eight, learning to love like God. But now let me take you to my point of stepping into an imperfect world. And this is important because we all, we, we all want things to be, uh, to be right. Uh, we, we want to do well, we want to prosper. We, we like things a certain way. Uh, we, we want our, our children, our grandchildren protected. We want our communities to prosper and flourish. And, uh, and for some of us, uh, perfection is a greater challenge than it is for others. That you really have to have things just a certain way. And, and you, sometimes you get a little OCD with it. And you, you just, you want things perfect. We all struggle with this to one degree or another, wanting a perfect world, uh, wanting possessions and prosperity and peace, and we want things to be right. And, and that's, a, that's a common thing that we all struggle with. As we look at verse nine, we find something here that's just, for me, it's, it's moving. You see, the fifth thing that I wanna share with you this, this morning is this, is that through the power of his love, the Father sent his perfect word into our imperfect world. Because he said in verse nine, the light of God's love shined within us when he sent his son into the world. A perfect word came to an imperfect people. A perfect word came into an imperfect world. Let me read you something that I found. Now, please know that I'm not promoting uh, Japanese philosophy, but there's something here that caught my attention and I just, I wanna share it with you. It's called the beauty of imperfections. And it's the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi. 
Now, centuries back, in the height of the Japanese autumn, in one of Kyoto's majestic gardens, a tea master asked his disciple to prepare for a tea ceremony. The young man trimmed the hedges, raked the gravel, picked the dried leaves from the stones, cleared the moss path of twigs. The garden looked immaculate. Not a blade of grass was out of place. The master inspected the garden quietly. Then he reached up at a branch of a maple tree and he shook it, watching the auburn leaves fall with haphazard grace on tided earth. There it was now, the magic of imperfection. There it was, the order of nature, never far from the hands of humans. There it was, what they call wabi-sabi, thought ma the master, the father of Japanese tea ceremony. Now, you have to know that the original meaning of wabi-sabi, the word wabi means the loneliness of living alone. The word sabi means withered, crushed. So actually it could read this way, the loneliness of brokenness. And that's where we are today in this room and those watching online is the loneliness of brokenness, that people are broken. Now, let me just clear the air and level the playing field. There's no one in this room or watching online that's not broken. That's why we say it often. I, I, I don't like repeating things, but it's the best teacher. But super spiritual people don't inspire, they intimidate because they don't tell their story. You see, they don't tell their story. That's why we talk often about scars or the credentials of the overcomer, where Jesus said to the disciples, look at my hands and my side. My scars are my credentials that I am who I say I am. You see, people want to hear your testimony. People need to know how you made it there and back. They wanna know what you learned. This is what people want. We minister not from what we know, but from what we are. We minister not from our head, but from our heart. We minister, excuse the crudeness, but we minister effectively when you're able to reach deep down inside of yourself and you get into the guts of the matter and you look out at the people and you're moved with compassion as Jesus was and you speak truth to them, not because you want to just impress or make people happy, but you want to help them. You want to help people. So love will always tell the truth and truth must always be spoken in love. And so you want to help people. But this wording here of the loneliness of brokenness, and that's where much of the church is because we all do the same, including me. We come to church on Sunday and we want to put our best foot forward and we wear our mask that we have for that particular Sunday. But behind the mask is all the brokenness and all the wounds and hurts and the stuff that we deal with, the real stuff, the stuff that we don't talk about in public, the struggles that we have, the fears, the apprehension, the confusion, the chaos, the struggles, the things we deal with, marriage, children, work, community, the things we deal with, health, we struggle. We struggle and we don't like to talk about it. We all wanna put our best foot forward. And in, in that, we see the loneliness of brokenness. Wabi-sabi. But over time, it began to change. You see, over time, the meaning of these words took on a more positive nuance. It began, it began to mean the beauty of perfect imperfections. Now hold that picture for a moment. You see that that bowl is cracked and decayed. And some of you ladies would pay a lot of money for that. <laughs> and if I'm wrong, you can correct me, but that's called the beauty of imperfections. That's what wabi-sabi came to mean. Not the loneliness of brokenness, but the beauty of brokenness or the beauty of imperfections. You see, there's a saying, 
about Wabi Sabi. Finding beauty in the imperfections of life and accepting the natural cycle of growth and decay. Now hold that picture. You see those blue jeans? You pay a bunch of money for that. It started out years ago where it was just distressed. And then it was a few holes and then your knee was out. And then uh, now I saw a girl the other day, it started like right here and all the way down to the bottom, it shredded. There was, you could just, just a few, just lines as you went down, shredded. And she paid a fortune for that, I imagine. And I, it was so bad, I wanted to walk up to her and go, no, 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 baby, no. It, it, you know, there, there's a line and you, you, you've crossed the line. I, you know, I get the, maybe a hole here, a little distress there, maybe a discoloration, maybe even, a, I don't wanna get the knees out, I don't like that. Shred it to the bottom. It looked like it was just kind of wrapped around the back of her leg, leg flapping. It's kind of, it's like, If you're wondering if you got too close to the line, listen, you, you crossed it. And the next time you see that, you can look at them and point down and go, Wabi Sabi. It's the beauty of imperfections. The search for beauty and imperfections. Now we're in verse nine, okay? Only through the light of God's love can we discover the beauty and the imperfections of people's lives. Because he said, the light of God's love shined within us when he sent his son into the world. The only way that you can really discover the beauty and the imperfections of people's lives is through the light of God's love. We all struggle with imperfections. Some feel they're too tall, too short, too fat, too skinny. They feel they're too this, too that. We all have personality quirks. Uh, we have certain physical attributes that we don't care for. Um, some of us uh, are challenged in certain areas where other people aren't. We all have imperfections. Some people deal with addictions. Some people have health issues that are because of genetics. It's passed down from generation to generation. They struggle with certain things. There's imperfections in this room. There's imperfections watching online. We all deal with that. We all wish we were more like others in certain areas. I wish I could be more like him or I wish I could be more like her. We all have imperfections. And Wabi Sabi is a teaching they have that looks for the beauty in the imperfections. The light of God's love shined within us. Jesus had a habit of seeing in others what others could not see. If it was a woman taken in adultery and thrown at his feet, he would reach down and ride in the sand. And that's a question I'll ask him when I get to heaven. What did you write? Amen. But we know that in the Old Testament, I believe it was Isaiah, he said he puts his word in stone, but the sins of his people, he writes it in sand. And the reason he does that is because with a breath of kindness, whew, he can blow our sins away. But his word stands forever. And so we know that our Father sees our imperfections. Corinthians, Paul said, when I am weak, then he is strong. God has a habit of taking a guy like Moses who would stutter to make him his mouthpiece. Think about that. Paul or Saul 
who persecuted the church becomes the apostle of the church. God has a habit of doing that. He sees the perfect imperfection because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And God wants to take our lives and do something beautiful with it. Think about that. The light of God's love. So when you approach people, no matter their station in life or their condition or what they're dealing with, when you approach people with all their stuff, the only way that you can really see them with their imperfections is through the love of God, through the light that his love brings. I want you to know this, that only through God's word can we bring freedom and meaning to the imperfection in people's lives. Because Psalms 119, it reads, I've learned that there is nothing perfect in this imperfect world except your words, for they are for they bring such fantastic freedom into my life. That one is a new one for me. Nothing perfect in this imperfect world except your words. So the only way that we can bring freedom to people's imperfections, the only way we can do that, whether it's, whether it's an addiction or whether it's an insecurity, this is not just about, when I say imperfections, I'm not just talking about we always go to sin. I'm not talking about that. It, it can be that. It, it can be that. And, and, and we're not making an excuse for sin or an excuse to neglect personal growth. I'm not making that excuse. But what I am saying is that there are imperfections in people's lives. Rather, it's an addiction, let's say, or insecurity. And the only way we can deal with those things effectively that brings fantastic freedom, as the psalmist said, is through God's perfect word. Through God's perfect word, we can, we can look at a world that's imperfect and we can bring freedom to them. We can step into somebody's imperfect world. And this is the word that Holy Spirit dropped in my heart here Two or three weeks ago, I was talking to someone and they were sharing with me their, their imperfections. They were sharing with me their brokenness. They were sharing with me a nightmare they were living in. And Holy Spirit whispered to me, step in to people's imperfections. Step into it. People need us to step into their imperfect world with the light of God's love. And then armed with his word, we bring freedom. They don't need us to pass judgment. They don't need us to bring condemnation. They need us to speak truth, but do it in love. They need us to deal with their insecurities or their imperfections, and, but do it through the love of God armed with the perfect word of God. Yes. Am I making any sense this morning? <laughs> Jesus did it with a woman that was thrown at his feet that was caught in adultery. He, he looked at her and he said, now sis, look, I, I'm not gonna condemn you. But I'm going to tell you, I want you to go and I, want you, I don't want you to do this anymore. I got a better plan for your life. You're better than this. You see, he looked at her with the light of God's love and he spoke truth to her. And that's what we have to do. You see, there are lessons of Wabi Sabi that they give and I just want to share a few of them with you. And they do this because they believe that in our pursuit of perfection, that often fosters judgment on people. Oh, you're doing what? You did what? I can't believe you did that. In our pursuit to be perfect, we often false, it often fosters judgment on other people. That's why I said at the beginning, 
you can't give away what you don't already have. And if you don't learn to forgive yourself, you'll never learn to forgive others. If you're intolerant of your imperfections, you'll be judgmental towards others and their imperfections. And that's a reality of life. If I'm intolerant of myself, I'll be intolerant of you. But if I hold myself accountable and I embrace God's love and God's mercy and I deal with it and I process it the way we should, Christian disciplines, but when I approach you because I've received my Father's love, I can offer it to you and give you the word of God and help you find freedom that I found. I have to be careful. But listen to these lessons of Wabi Sabi. Don't you like saying that, Wabi Sabi? <laughs> listen to this. Wabi Sabi invites a pause and creates a space for acceptance and forgiveness. When someone does you wrong or someone does wrong, if you have this in your heart, this teaching of God's word, suddenly, instead of being quick to judge, quick to react, quick to, to lash out, quick to condemn, it will help you to pause. And it creates a space space for acceptance acceptance of the person do you know you can accept someone without approving of their their behavior when I was a kid they used to say God loves the sinner he just hates the sin but do you do understand we can we can create a space where we accept people even though we don't always approve of their insecurities, imperfections, struggles, or sin. But Wabi Sabi creates this space of acceptance and forgiveness. You see, when you realize you've been forgiven, it makes it a lot easier to forgive others. Number two, Wabi Sabi invites mindfulness. You're mindful seeing flawed beauty in ourselves and others flawed beauty, that God will take my imperfections and my flawed life, and there's a beauty to that because when I'm weak, he is strong. That God uses the, the things that are not to tear down the things that are. That God uses the weak to tear down the mighty. I, you, you suddenly see that God can take a guy like Moses who stutters and make him his voice. I understand Aaron and Aaron spoke for him, but Moses was the voice of God. Think about that. That God can use people like that, that are flawed, that are not perfect. Do you find hope in that? I do. That God can take a guy that stutters and use him to deliver his people. And so this teaching on Wabi Sabi, it allows us to see the flawed beauty. That's why I spoke of it last Sunday where when I said, there's something I get excited about when I see somebody that is uh, under the anointing and God's using them, especially when they have a testimony. When, when, and when God brought them out, yes. are, are you with me? Yes. I, you know, when God, when God picks them up, broken and bruised and busted and crushed and trampled and ran over, and he picks them up and he puts them right in the center stage and God uses them, uses them with all their stuff, with all their history. God uses them to minister to people. And you just sit back and you smile and you go, look at God go. Look at that. It's powerful. Number three, Wabi Sabi invites appreciation for time's passage and decay. It, 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 it has an appreciation for decay, for time, for scars. There's something about a man or a woman that's been in a few fights. There's something about a man or a woman like Jacob who, who's been to Peniel and has had to wrestle with God and he walks with a limp. I've told the staff before that I never want to work 
for someone that doesn't walk with a limp. I, if, if I'm going to work for a man of God, I want to know that man of God has been to hell and back. I want to know he's been to Peniel. I want to know he's fought some battles. I want to know that man of God, he walks up to the pulpit like this with a limp because he's going to minister from his heart and his gut and not from his head. I, I, want, I want my ministry to be more, more than just something I heard or read. I want it to be something that I've experienced, that I know it down in here. I want that. I want to walk with a limp. And, and I, I made a statement here about a year ago, standing over here on the floor. It was uh, uh, sometimes leaders have to be broken in order to lead people out of brokenness. And, and, and when you give purpose or when you give meaning or purpose to suffering, it becomes tolerable. And as I've said to you before, oftentimes when I'm am at Peniel and I'm wrestling with God and I'm fighting it, and I mean I'm, I'm, it's, I mean I'm fighting God and I mean I'm, I'm wrestling this thing. And all along, God's trying to get me to break down and tell him my name. What is it you want, Jacob said. He said, I want you to finally tell me, son, what you really are. Okay, I'm Jacob. I'm a, I'm a tripster is what it means in the Hebrew. I trip people. I, take the, I try to work the angle to always have an advantage over people. I'm a, I'm a, I, I manipulate people. There, are you happy? God said, yeah, I am, because now you're Israel. And he walks out of there with a limp, able to face his world. Listen, when you wrestle with God, you're fighting it hard. And God is trying to get you to say it. This is who I am. It's powerful. And you walk out of there with a limp. But then you're able to truly minister and that's when you discover that when you give purpose to suffering, it becomes tolerable. Because when I'm there wrestling with him, I remind myself, you're in it now. But just remember, one day you'll help somebody else. And it helps. Number four, Robbie Sabi invites acceptance and creates a space to love ourselves and to love others. It allows us to. So here we go. Statement for you. I want you to listen to this one. Love will create a space or make room for others. Religion has a bad, nasty habit of excluding people. You can't be a part of our group unless you look this way, dress this way, talk this way, smell this way, act this way, worship this way, do church this way. It doesn't make room for them. That's why I'm always concerned about people coming into our services and not feeling welcomed loved, cared for. We're excited you're here. And we make room for you. Do we make room? You see, in the book of Acts chapter 15, the Gentile or, or the churches and the Gentile Christians sent a letter to the elders of Jerusalem. And they, they sent this letter, the churches did, to the elders saying, listen, we, we need your counsel because we don't, know, we don't know what to do with these Gentile Christians. Hey, Gentile Christians. They eat meat offered to idols or they do this or they wear them funky sandals that we don't wear or, you know. These Gentile Christians were not measuring up to these Jews. And they said, we don't know what to do. And those elders and their wisdom, they made room for them. They said, here's a few things we want you to tell them. They made room for them. We have to make room for people. I'm not talking about tolerating, excusing sin. If you're going there, you're in the wrong room because I'm not even near that room. But I am talking about people's imperfections and the flawed beauty of people's lives. And we have to know that love creates a space or it makes room for them. Now, hold on, buckle up, take a deep breath. You ready? First Peter chapter four. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. Okay? You got it? Love deeply. 
So here's the question. How deep will your love allow you to see into the broken soul? How deep will your love allow you to see? Remember, he said, with a lot of God's love, he came. So with a lot of God's love, and I look into a person's soul, how deep can you see? How deep can you go? How deep can you go? Now, there seems to be a line with most of us. How deep will your love allow you to go into humanity? How, how deep? You can deal with this, this one here. Okay, I got that one. Uh, yeah, I can, I can tolerate this, this one here. Uh, this person, yeah, but I'm getting uncomfortable now. This one, ooh, this is it. That one there, can't get there. I can't get there. How deep will your love allow you to go? Because he said love deeply. Because love covers everything. You see, there's no sin too great. How many would agree with me that there's no sin that God won't forget? I mean, there's, when you got saved, was there, in, was there a checklist in your life where God said, well, I'll forgive you adultery, but I won't forgive you this. I forgive you that, but not that. I mean, was there a checklist? Or was his, did his love cover a multitude of your sins? Does our love cover a multitude of sin? You see, when you search a broken soul, make sure you see with the light of his love armed with the wisdom of his word. That's how you do it. Luke chapter 10. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. If you can see with God's love armed with the wisdom of his word, you're blessed and God will always give himself to you. So my prayer today, give us eyes to see the beauty and the possibilities in our perfect imperfections. Stephen, come help me. Give us eyes to see the beauty and the possibilities in our perfect imperfections. To look at someone and tell them, I'm so excited for you because God's gonna take your story and turn it into a testimony. And one day, you're gonna be able to lead people out. When I look at Boomer, and Jeannie, when I look at Mike and Phil McConnor, I see these people that have come out of a lifestyle and they stand up in front of a group of people and they tell them what God did for me, God will do for you. The Bible says, Corinthians 9, we have this treasure in earthen jars of clay. In this time, a homeowner would take his most valuable possessions and he would put them in the ugliest jar, a uh, uh, clay jar that he had, the ugliest one. The one that everyone would look over. That was his safe of that time. Ugly clay jar. You put your money in there, you put your valuables. Knowing that when a thief comes in, he's gonna look up at that clay jar, ugly thing, go, ah, there, there can be no Think of value in that and he'll overlook it. Hate to say it that way, but God took his most precious treasure and put it inside your ugly life. Now, here's the deal. The responsibility of the clay jar was not to draw attention to itself but to simply house and protect the treasure. Think about it. So God can look at a guy like this. 
15 years old, he says, son, I want you to preach my gospel. When I felt totally unqualified, think of that. when we look at each other we need to look past the ugliness and we need to see the treasure so John the Apostle one of the twelve disciples of Jesus wrote the three letters of John wrote the book of Revelation laid his head on the breast of Jesus and heard the heart of God and historians tell us that John at the end of his life would only speak three words love one another.